Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this, a tortoise thinking on Britain and slavery. Who profited and what should they do now? Um, my name is James Harding. I'm the editor and co-founder of Tortoise. And when we started, we had this idea, uh, a relatively simple one, which was how would you take some of the most interesting and difficult subjects that we face as individuals, as a society, and instead of doing what journalists have historically done, which is talk about them amongst themselves, open up the news meeting and try and make sure that we came away with a better informed point of view, better informed by all of our members. And so if you've not been to a thinking before, I just wanted to introduce you to the very simple idea. It, it's really intended to operate like an, like an editorial meeting, like a leader conference, where everyone comes with their different points of view. You're not expected to agree. In fact, it's intended to be a forum for civilised disagreement. But the great benefit of it is how much we can learn from those different points of view. So in the course of the coming hour, we've got a wealth of expertise, people who have really spent years, decades, studying and thinking about this particular set of issues but actually what's really important is that everyone comes to it with a point of view with an opinion with with, with thoughts and we want to hear as many of those as possible um my colleague luke bedemer um put together the slides that you saw right at the start there and i'm going to come to luke in a moment just to talk through what that means but as you can see there we've got professor kane day andrews who's uh, come and joined us kane thank you very much for for being here uh, today, my colleague Liz Mosley is here. She is doing that impossible thing of uh, trying to make sure that she corrals all the conversations that happen in the chat. So I look forward to uh, uh, hearing from you uh, directly. And the one thing I should just say is there are a couple of ways in which you can get hold of of me and make sure your point is brought into the conversation. One is just stick up your digital blue hand you know the way Zoom calls work by now, or actually if you write in the chat, often what we'll do is just say, okay, well, that's an interesting point. Let's let's bring you in and my colleague, Sam Hockley, will get in touch and make sure your video's on and we'll, uh, we'll bring you into the conversation. Um, um, we're joined by, as I said, some really extraordinary people in this field. Um, uh, I'm gonna come in a moment and, and introduce Sir Hilary uh, Beckles, who's uh, not only the Vice Chancellor of the University of West Indies, but actually critical in this in thinking about the uh, uh, CARICOM uh, reparatory justice. Um, I'd also like to just wave in the direction of Keith McClelland, because one of the things that's been really kind of invigorating for us journalistically is realizing at the start of this, that there is a way of beginning to answer this question who profited. There is actually a body of data and research that makes it much easier to understand the answer to some of those uh, questions. And so what we hope to do in the course of this evening is pull together what we've learned, what effectively you've learned about who's profited, and then begin to try and address the questions. Uh, to many people, they will seem uh, obvious and urgent. To others, they will see, you know, complicated and uh, and political and and heavily freighted. Um, but the beauty of the conversation this evening is that we're trying to get at different points of view on those on those subjects. Um, I said I'm going to start with Sir Hillary because. Um, Partly, Sir Hilary, because I'm so interested in reparatory justice and the, actually, we come, keep coming to Kane Day, but I think Sir Hilary is amongst us, is he? Um, um, uh, Sir Hilary Beckles, are you there? I hope so. Yes, I am. Ah, you're there. Ah, there hello. You go, yes, thank um, you. Thank you very much. Listen, I'm giving you the big uh, introduction uh, there, um, and then and then find that we wouldn't be able to find you. But I wondered whether you could give us the first sort of step on this by just trying to sort of explain for people, and I'm ashamed to say people like me, who feel as though, oh, well, I studied history, I should sort of be across some of these issues. But if I'm perfectly honest with you, Sir Hilary, the, the, the truth is that actually my kind of awakening moment was actually a few months ago interviewing David Olasoga and suddenly seeing the extent to which the Royal African Company and the profits of the Royal African Company went directly into the coffers of the Royal Family thinking, I never learned any of this. I don't really know anything about this. And so I'd love you to sort of start, if you like, by just talking us through a little bit about who profited as far as you can see in the UK case from slavery, and then we'll get on to a little further sort of reparatory justice. Um, 
Well, thank you so very much. W would you wish me to make a, a five minute introductory statement? <laughs> no, just, no, no, just, just sort of spell out if you would, what you think is sort of, you know, in a couple of minutes to start, because we'll have it as an okay. open conversation. Okay. What, you, what you think is really the, the, uh, an issue here? Well, yes, I, I, I do share your point. Let's begin with your own biographical statements in which you said you've studied history and, and knew nothing of these issues. Um, you know, I, I'm also a, a history graduate of, of the British university system. And I, I remember once uh, as an as a undergraduate, a, a very distinguished uh, British professor was given a seminar uh, uh, on the expansion of, of, of global Britain. And I asked him the question about why is it that he has made no reference to Eric Williams' uh, book of 1944, which is now considered the classic, uh, Capitalism and Slavery. Mm -hmm. And I remember the professor was absolutely exploding with rage and lost his composure by saying that Williams had the audacity to, to argue that there was a relationship between the, the, the rise of, of slavery in the British Empire and, and the rise of the British industrial civilization. He was outraged by this. And I, it struck me, I was probably 18 years old and couldn't understand why he had lost his composure. And, uh, but later on, I, I became um, a vice president for the UNESCO, uh, the Slave Roots Project. And uh, one of the tasks I was asked to undertake was a project in which we, we took samples of hundreds of schools across Europe that had any reference to slavery in their, in their curriculum. And, and this was uh, back in the, the 1990s. And our results from Britain have looked at over a thousand high schools that only 2% of them uh, had any reference to slavery, slave trade in, uh, in, the, in the history curriculum. So generations of, of British citizens, I guess like yourself, I came to maturity with absolutely no formal knowledge, no academic knowledge at all of this subject. And, uh, and, and this, this is really a critical issue right now in the discourse, which is why there are many people who are now coming to uh, some knowledge of this matter mm. and are saying, well, I wish I knew or we didn't know this. But it's also easy for them to go on to say, but it has nothing to do with me. This was my great, great grandparents. It has nothing to do with me. I'm, I, I'm living in the 21st century and there's no connection between my life and what, and what my country might have done and benefited because they do not have the content to say, well, hold on a minute. This lifestyle that I'm taking for granted, the institutions around me that I'm taking for granted, the banks, the insurance companies, all of these things, the major corporations that I engage every day, I might be working with them. I have, mm. you know, their origins has nothing to do with me. So it, it is a very important matter, the, the royal family. In fact, just last night, I was reflecting upon this, writing a paper and came across the charter, which was granted by, um, by, by uh, King Charles II uh, to the Royal African Company uh, to go out to Africa and, uh, and ascertain 6,000 enslaved people per year for distribution across the West Indian colonies and with the seal of the King of England. And, 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 and how 80% of the stock of the company was owned by the royal family. Yes. And, they, and King, King James, was a, uh, when, he was, when he was Duke of York, when he was Prince, he was the chairman of the board of directors of the company and uh, he alone got 30% of the revenue from the company. So it goes on and on and on. So there's a tremendous amount of, of knowledge, but basically where we are now, it, it has become now the, the age of the apology. Yes. where the, the Church of England has issued its apology. I, I was born on the island of Barbados, about five miles away from the Codrington plantations, the slave plantations, which were owned by the Church of England uh, for over a hundred years. And the Church of England ran the slave plantations. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the bishops uh, ran the account 
uh, the, the plantations had to be profitable. The Africans on the plantations were stamped on their left shoulder when they were purchased at the slave auction. They were stamped C of E, Church of England, and that was a stamp to, to differentiate their, their slaves from other plantations. So we have this tremendous history, and now it's all coming there, and now we have this age of apologies. But it seems that what, what has taken place here is a relationship of power that you you say you're sorry you apologize and you walk away so apologize and walk away we ha and finally we have a situation with the universities where the universities were a critical part of the architecture of the slavery system mm -hmm. they were the ones who defined it their, their their research allowed it to happen if you consider for example when John Locke was declaring that black people were not human but were subhuman, part of a subhuman species, and while he was writing about the theory of freedom and liberty not being applicable to Africans who were subhuman, he was professor of philosophy at Oxford. Um, you know, um, you can go on. Adam Smith and the magnificent work, The Wealth of Nations, <laughs> in, which he, in which he says, listen, this slavery malarkey has become very expensive. Uh, and we should get rid of it. But, you know, it is now cheaper and more economical to take the slave, give the slave freedom, pay them a wage, mm -hmm. and the wage that you will pay them will be less than the cost of maintaining them as slaves. So the, the, the post-slavery period, you can actually extract more wealth from them mm -hmm. by freeing them than by keeping them as slaves. And he worked through the economics. While he was doing this, uh, he was professor of, of, of economics at, at Glasgow, uh, Carlyle, but, 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 who, who wrote those famous articles on, on black African inferiority, he was professor at Oxford, then you go on and on. Yet the university's position is, it seemed to be research it, yeah. put the information out there and walk away from it. In other words, research and run. So research and run seem to be the response of the universities. The church have said, we're sorry, walk away. So, conf so, so confronting the history and at the same time, turning your back and walking away seem to be the, the contemporary um, circumstance. And Hilary, you, you, you've sort of opened us up on a larger set of historic, ethical and political issues in an opening four or five minutes than I can remember. <laughs> I'm, just gonna, I'm, just gonna, I'm, I'm just, sorry for uh, overburdening in the conversation. Oh, really? It's so interesting because, you know, listening to it and, you know, I appreciate a lot of people joining us this evening, as I said, have a kind of depth of expertise. For those of us trying to figure out a way through this, you know, I hear what you say about culture and education. You know, I should actually put my hand on my heart and say not only did I not know, you know, you know, nearly enough about this subject, but what was amazing was the amount I'd studied about slavery in the U.S., as that was, you know, it was, it was a U.S. issue. And even at Tortoise, you know, one of the early takes we did was on the argument for reparations in the U.S. context. We hadn't turned that kind of, uh, you know, spotlight on ourselves. So it's quite ingrained. But I'm also struck by your point about institutions and institutional responsibilities, whether it's the royal family or the church or the university. And I'm also really rattled by the relationship between history past wrongs and present responsibilities and how you how you navigate that and so i want and that's why i want to say i'd like to just i want to go to kenley andrews if i might and i'm going to come to a few others and then come back to you hillary if i can because i was really fascinated today to look at the caricom reparatory justice case i didn't read as much as i probably need to but i'm really intrigued by what you've chosen and the agenda you've chosen for that but i'm going to come back if i may in a moment hillary because i want to come to professor andrews if, if i can 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 you i'm going to do something very simplistic which is like who profited and what should they do just on the who profited piece of this right as a you know you're a professor in this world how good is the is the evidence here how good is the you know are the records to be able to have some real clarity and in 2020 point the finger and say this institution this family this company profited well i think actually in terms of like so in in terms of trying to trace the money from slavery profits there's quite yeah. a lot written uh, eric williams capital slavery is quite good um it's almost impossible to kind of 
I mean, no, you can isolate and say, look, what companies, the church, what people, what individuals. Yeah. And it's a bigger point where it's just generally the whole entire system is based on the wealth from slavery, right? right. Like, I mean, I'm from Birmingham, for instance, and um, James Watt is kind of a saint here um, because of his great industrialist. And we kind of have this immaculate conception narrative of British industry as though it just arose because Brit British people were so great and forget that actually where was the first place that used the steam engine? It was plantations in the Caribbean. Sugar was the first thing that we could find. Uh, and James Watt was heavily indebted to slavery and, and really said so himself. Like, look, we need to keep slavery. This is a really part of our, a big part of our economy. And then if you think about things like the cotton industry, uh, Manchester, I mean, Manchester literally grows Yes, in proportion to the canal that links Liverpool as a slave as, as a slave um, trading capital to Manchester, so it's it's there is this kind of individual company conversation you could have, but there's a bigger picture where you say, let's all the wealth that we have um, is kind of based large, not just on slavery but colonialism, etc., and it's intertwined into the cities and into everything, and you can't really trace it, which is why the numbers are so big, and so huge. I mean, the the thing, the real, the really like the thing that said this isn't history, this is present because the wealth from slavery is still very much with us and the poverty is with us as well. I mean, like as Hillary Beckles is from the Caribbean, my family's from the Caribbean, you cannot explain poverty in the Caribbean today or the, we're having Black Lives Matter protests in the UK and how Black African Caribbean people are treated in the UK. Well, there's a reason our families have, have less generational wealth. There's a pretty obvious reason, right? Is it slavery? There was no, there was never, there, we never, we, we not only were we exploited, but never benefited, um, but not, but never recompensed. And that's where this preparations argument comes in. And actually, uh, Keith McLean is the person to talk to you about the, the reparations that were paid, right? Which were actually paid to slave owners. That is huge payment, crazy big payment paid to slave owners. I know, um, by the way, when we, when we first started looking into this subject, or started, that was the thing that someone had to explain twice to me. I was like, sorry, can you say that again? Is that, but but, but can I just, but can I just, but can, can I just, just follow up on your point, right? Just so I understand, when you say, look, yes, of course you can identify the institutions or the companies or the, you know, families that are beneficiaries, but actually this is systemic. Yeah. Two things arise for me. One is, does that mean that the process of identifying the direct beneficiaries is, is an act of scapegoating, that you look at it and think, okay, well, listen, it's easy for the society if we can identify Green King, for example, and say, you know, they're in the dock for this by implication i'm not right is that what you worry about and then the second question i've got is if it is systemic there is a massive conversation that let's face it has has barely begun which is to try and say a society feels responsibility for things that happened you know some hundreds of years ago directly connected to their, their their circumstances today but they are able to look at you okay i totally understand your point about these structural problems but i didn't do that you know how do you how do you land that the, the answer to those two questions uh, yeah that's why i think it's important to, to not just focus on the individual families and, and companies because that's that kind of makes the wrong argument right that like there's there's a debt that green king can pay and then they can just pay that off and it's it's, it's done this is far more systemic. So the book that I've just finished, almost finished writing, it comes out in February, it's called The New Age of Empire, How Racism and Colonialism Still Rule the World. And in it, I essentially made the argument that the Atlantic system- yeah, How it uh, still rules the world. Is that still rules the world, like it hasn't changed. This is the other thing, it hasn't changed. Like there's a particular logic that says, yeah. black life is inferior, you can treat us as chattel, you can oppress us, white supremacy, et cetera. And that still is what happens today. But let's just look at a map of global inequality. We'll find Africa's the poorest place in the world and the white place is the richest, and there's a hierarchy, right? That's not by accident, that's by design. And the Atlantic system of slavery was so important to the West because they generated so much profit and so much wealth. And prior to the Atlantic system, the West is not advanced, it's not ahead of anywhere, anywhere else. In fact, you could make the argument the West is actually behind most of the world. And it's the wealth from the Atlantic system, which is then used to generate industry, to generate other forms of colonialism. Uh, and it's just spread out throughout the entire system. There is no meaningful way to separate this out and say that. Some people are guilty and others are not. It is the system which is still with us, the wealth is still with us, the poverty is still with us. And it, it, that's the way that we should talk about uh, reparations. So, Katie, thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to this because I want to, uh, in a, I want in a moment to just kind of promise Edge of Four because he's researching this subject too. And I know uh, that, that shortly, um, uh, uh, Bell Ribeiro Andy is gonna join us, the MP from Streatham who's got views too. But but Keith McClellan, can I, can I just, Bring you in just for a second because Kendi mentioned you. Um, when we started this, Keith, it was sort of um, 
you know, that kind of wonder where you're like, oh my God, there's just this body of work at UCL. It, it's not just the, 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 the data that you've got, but the organization of it around cultural issues, commercial issues, um, political issues. C could you just help us understand how, how, it's, how possible it is to track the answer to the simple question, who profited from slavery? What, what's the mechanism by which you follow, that, follow up on that and identify the beneficiaries right up to the present day? Well, Ken does right that it's very difficult to do that. Um, uh, I mean, the LBS project at UCL, after all, doesn't identify the whole consequences of slavery. What did Actually, I sorry, I'm just going to explain. The, it's, it's, it's the legacies of, for people who don't know, it's the legacies of British slave ownership at well, UCL. It, it, the core of it, yeah. it are the people who were direct beneficiaries in the 1830s of compensation paid out to slave owners. Uh, and, uh, and of course, you're quite right that this leaves people aghast that it wasn't paid to the enslaved themselves. Is it possible? Certainly it is possible in, the, in certain institutions. I mean, they, some have got great prominence this year, like the Bank of England, uh, like Lloyd's Insurance and the Green King and so on. It's possible to track certain individuals where they are very prominent. But one of the things that is important to understand is that of the, if you take 47,000 individuals, which is the rough number of people who receive compensation, and then you multiply that by the number of descendants as well as the immediate members of their own families, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. Is it possible to personally identify them? In most cases, no, it isn't. The more important point, and here I entirely agree with Kind about this, is that this is a structural question. It's about the consequences of a slave ownership is simply one dimension, one aspect of a whole system, uh, which was generated from the 15th, 16th centuries from Europe uh, uh, onwards. Um, so identifying people is difficult. It can, as I say, be done in some cases. Is it important to do it? Well, it's important to do it, but it seems to me more important to focus on the long-term consequences for the Caribbean and elsewhere of that system and to think about reparations in that context, because part of what some people want to do with the individual, the question of individuals, is to say, it's time you paid up in terms of reparations as an individual or as an individual family. That seems to be largely missing the point. The point is about structural inequalities within the global capitalist economy. I, I, th I think so, Keith, although I would say as someone who's, as you can hear, new and naive in the subject, it feels to me incredibly important to be able to identify those stories, not for the reason of finger pointing, but f for someone like me to be able to make the connection to a world that, that, that's, that's easy to sort of consign to the past and actually see the thread all the way to today is, is incredibly powerful. Well, it is important to do that, but there's a limit to the extent to which one can say, let's say you take some famous people who are connected, like, say, the actor Benedict Cumberbatch, mm. uh, and say, well, he, yes, okay, this is a, this is a way of identifying those connections. Does mm. it get to the essential political matter? Right. Arguably, it doesn't. It, it throws some light on that, but it isn't the core of what the political arguments should be about. Uh, and, um, you know, I would add something to what Kenda was saying, and I would add something to what Hillary was saying, which is that um, uh, slavery wasn't the only basis of British capitalism. It was mm. an absolutely crucial element, but it wasn't the only thing. Right. Uh, and the second thing to comment on something Hillary said, in saying that uh, universities are walking away, well, some universities certainly are walking away. Research projects like LBS are absolutely not walking away from this. And we spend a great deal of time doing educational work as well as our research work, trying to uh, make pe get people to understand what the connections between slavery and contemporary Britain are. It, it, I, I, and not I, 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 
it may be also, of course, that UCL is, is quite exceptional in this case, because as you've, if you've been, as you were speaking, and as, as Ken and Hillary were speaking, it's quite striking how many people have picked up on this university's point, Hillary, that you made at the top about research and run. And, and I want to, if I may, bring in Ellie House and Samantha Knights and, uh, and Zav Greenwood on that in, in one moment. I'm just going to bring Promise in first. Promise, enter your four. Are, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Are you, are, you, are you listening to this and thinking, well, what are you thinking, actually? <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, who benefited from the slave trade, right? Yeah, and what and, should uh, that's, a, that's a straightforward question, right? Um, and I would say that the problem with the analysis of slavery is that we tend to look at only one continent or one uh, particular country. We tend to look at, okay, uh, is either Britain or America. There is no other analysis beyond America or Britain. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's unfair mm -hmm. because Not the true. slave trade was a triangular trade. What, what, what did it mean to be a triangular trade? It connected three different continents. And mm -hmm. in three di different con continents of which Africa was included, there were three different political elites who were making profit from this, this kinds of trade, from selling people. Mm -hmm. So if you come down to Africa, for instance, uh, and I, I'm from the Igbo, Igbo ethnic group in Nigeria, uh, and there's a particular people, uh, actually Ugo Wokeji has written a book uh, about this. He calls it the book, the, the, the Slave Trade and Culture in So there's a particular people in the, amongst the Igbo community called the Aro. Mm -hmm. It's a particular group, ethnic group within the Igbo society. Yeah. And this, the, the culture of this group, the political economy of this particular ethnic group within the Igbo land was built on slavery. They profited a lot from slavery and they didn't capture most of their own people. They had to take other people from the Ibibio tribe, the Akba tribe and other ethnic groups around uh, yeah, region. But, but can, I, can I just ask you a question then? So, so, yeah. To follow the logic through of that, the, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't cancel the argument for reparations or reparatory justice in principle. It just complicates it in terms of the execution of that idea, doesn't it? It means you're going to have to apply those principles to different groups. No, it, it, it cancels reparation because the idea of reparation is that there is a particular group who we are victimized, who we are enslaved, and who we are taken away. And that this other group, we have to actually, this group that has profited from it, has to transfer at least some resources or uh, uh, change the system to make the lives of these victims better. In a mm -hmm. sense, it's a way of victimizing the people, denying the African societies who participated in the slavery and sold their own people. It was a demand and supply. Without a supply and demand, there will be no market, like every other commodity. So if the African group did not capture their own people and sold them to slavery, there yeah. wouldn't be any, any slavery at all. If they had wrestled, and if you read Walter Rodney, uh, I Walter do... Rodney said in the 1600s, when the slave, the slave owners, when the slave masters came down to Africa, that Africa and Europe were equal. So if they wanted to fight with Europe, at mm. that time, they could have defeated Europeans automatically. So, so, they could so, have defeated them, but so, so, they didn't fight them. Slavery was not based on fighting. It was simply a consensual agreement between those, uh, the political elites within Africa and the political elites uh, outside Africa who came to trade with European elites. And what happened? Let me I'm tell you what happened. I'm just interrupt, no, I'm just gonna interrupt you one second. Forgive me if I do. Yeah. One, one of the things I often say about our new digital lives is that it's sometimes yeah. very difficult to pick up on the non-verbal communication that's in the room. But if, as you were speaking, you'd picked up on Hilary Beckles' non-verbal communication, you'd get the impression that someone wants to get in in response. And am I right, Hilary, you just want to respond to Promise? Yes, because um, you began the program with reference to how British citizens were clearly not informed um, <laughs> about the history of this subject. Mm -hmm. But what we also know that most Africans are not informed either. And, and because largely they're not informed, you, you hear the kind of stuff that you've just heard. 
which, which really shows a tremendous amount of ignorance uh, within Africa uh, about this history. When we attended the Durban conference in South Africa 2001, what we had there was interesting. <laughs> civil society, all of the civil society organizations in Africa were calling for reparations mm. and the government were not. And it was a classical case of citizens versus governments. The citizens of Ghana and Nigeria, the organizations all came and supported reparations and the government of Ghana and Nigeria did not because mm. they found it convenient to do so. And part of that convenience, I remember speaking to a British prime minister um, I wouldn't call, I wouldn't call his name, but he said to me, you know, you can, there, there is, there is probably more Nigerian elite money in British banks mm. uh, than, than there is British money in British banks. But this is not about elites. Mm. First of all, let me say this. You cannot commit a major crime without local partners. That's right. a person. You cannot have a major crime of any international significance without local partners. The presence of local partners does not mean that the crime is not hideous. In fact, makes it even more so that right. you're using a small number of people to victimize a massive amount of citizens. Mm -hmm. the, the comparison is very clear. If you compare, for example, the narcotics trade with the slave trade, there are some very striking similarities between the global narcotics trade and, and, and the slave trade. Mm. The first comparison is this. The companies that ran the slave trade, like the Royal African Company of Britain, those corporations had more money, more capital, more military, paramilitary, guns, armies, than most of the, com most of the countries they met in Africa. Mm -hmm. We have the records of the Royal African Company of Britain. Yeah. The records are available for public view. The company moved into West Africa with tremendous military capacity. Mm -hmm. Very much like how the, the international narcotic companies, uh, they have more resources than small countries. Yeah. Some, of these, some of these drug cartels have more money and more power than small nations. Mm -hmm. And they threaten small nations. So, and, and that was the, the, the same pattern. The, so the slave trade companies go into West Africa. And we have information in the Royal African Company where out of Whitehall is a letter to the head of the military mm. of the company in West Africa mm -hmm. that the king, the king of this country is standing in the way of our business. Mm -hmm. And you have permission to execute him. Right. We have those records. Yeah. That here is a small African nation with a king who's decided that he doesn't want to be a part of this, but he's resisting, and the authority comes out from London to execute him. Mm -hmm. So we have that information. Uh, yes, there is no doubt that from time to time, certain kings in Africa would negotiate. Oh. Up oh. against oh. a power structure, they would negotiate. We won't take our own people. We wouldn't take our own people, but we will get some people from next door. This yes. is about power. Yes. This is about military power and how small countries buckle under the pressure of these major corporations. Now, I can <laughs> let me go one step further. I'm going to come back. Point. Oh, yes, sorry, go on. There's one final point. Let us be clear on this. I believe that the majority of British people in the 17th and 18th centuries were not supportive of the slave trade. There were movements, there were movements in the 17th and 18th centuries that said that slave trading was wrong, it was unchristian, it was sinful, all of that was going on. But here's the issue. The government took the decision mm -hmm. that, that this business was in the national interest. Mm -hmm. And when the government makes the decision that a, a line of business is in the national interest, the citizens can say what they wish. Yeah. The citizens are dismissed because the state takes the decision that this is in the national interest. In West Africa, the citizens were run into the forest. They were run into the desert. The citizens were abandoning their villages, abandoning their towns and, and flight, even though you would have 
the occasional king who would say, but I can make some money out of this. But the citizens were in flight. And oftentimes it's a case, you cannot blame an entire people for what their governments do. Though the governments are responsible. Those are the issues you have to discuss. Hilary, I'm, I'm only interrupting you because I don't want it to be the last point, because it feels to yeah. me as though we haven't even got to the difficult stuff yet. So we haven't yeah. really got into the reparations question. We've got into just, you know, the absence of an agreed history or an understanding of history. I, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm going to invite in a few, few people, if I might, because Ellie House made an interesting point on the university's question. And, I, and it feels to me as though that's a subject that has got a long way to run. I don't know whether Ellie, you're there. And I, I want to bring in Samantha Knights too, because she made a point about actually the first teaching of a real course on this. And I'm interested to hear what that is and, and, and what, what, you're, what you're learning. But Ellie, are you there? Yeah, hi. Hello. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to ask a question to Hilary mainly, but my um, Cambridge college last year, um, discovered a bell um, that had been um, from a slave plantation and it was bad that they only discovered it last year and various issues with that but their, their response to to this issue it was very controversial in the media was to um, immediately put a funding for a big research project they did a huge you know loads of students did loads of research into the the college's um, history with slavery history with race um, and you know they donated the bell to a museum um, abroad and I just wondered, you, you said that a lot of um, universities kind of are just researching and running. Mm. Um, I wondered what else you, th you think that they should be doing. Is it that you think universities should also be paying reparations or is that more of just a government thing? And if, if not, then what should universities do other than research? Hilary, I'm gonna hold you at bay for one second. So I just wanna take a few points in before I come back to you, Ellie. Okay. And then um, can, I, can I just ask Samantha, just tell me, is Samantha Knight, are you there? Um, yes, I'm here. Hello, hello. So hello. tell us what are you doing? Um, so actually, I came in when you were talking about um, your lack of knowledge about slavery, and it, it sort of echoed my trajectory, having gone all the way through five different schools in the UK and then ending up doing history at Oxford, where slavery wasn't mentioned. And it wasn't until I got to SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, that I realised how impoverished um, my own education had, had been. But um, the course that I'm moderating at the moment, and in fact, I just came out of that um, just before um, I'm coming here, um, is um, a course we're doing a non-credit course because it may take another 100 years to get a <laughs> slavery course listed um, on the history curriculum at Oxford. It, it's a multidisciplinary course and I'm, I work as a barrister actually, I work in uh, modern slavery um, and trafficking predominantly at the moment. And I, I became very aware of this sort of trying to look at these issues without really understanding all the different facets, whether you're talking about economics or history or politics or medicine. And so the, the course that I'm moderating and put together brings in people from all sorts of disciplines and it, it's yeah. listed to uh, for all students so we've got students from all, all sorts of disciplines but interestingly the faculty we're bringing in with um, one exception um, um, are from um, universities like Hull, um, Liverpool um, and the uh, legacies of British slave ownership is on our reading list um, and so you know, there's a real there's a real problem with education, but it begins at primary um, level as well and upwards. My children have spent some time being um, educated in Miami, and there, you know, children at the age of, you know, well, primary age, age children learn about um, American history. My children here are, are learning about uh, slavery, but from an American perspective, yeah. then what they're not being taught about at the moment is. Um, is um, is slavery from our you know from our own perspective, and it definitely needs to be addressed from um, from all angles. Well, firstly, good for you that it is happening because that's 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 something something new. I'm going to yeah. I'm going to do two things if I can. Firstly, Luke Bedemer, I said I'd ask Luke just to explain the slides, which I love Luke to do, just so that we rattle through what everyone saw at the top if they did see it at the top. And then I think that Bedis Ribeiro Addy has joined us. Um, Bell, sorry, um, Ribeiro Addy has joined us. And if Bell's there, I'm going to come to you first before I go back to you, Hilary, and I'm going to go back to Katie as well. Mm -hmm. um, Luke, do you want to talk us through those? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try and do so quickly because I think it'd be better to hear from um, everybody on the call, but um, yes. So uh, visible here is just some of the, the initial findings from looking at the UCL archive. 
Um, but given we've got an expert on the call, I'd actually just encourage everybody to go and look for themselves and see what they can find. There are lots of different ways of uh, categorizing and organizing the, the data as, uh, um, as James mentioned at the start. So we can move on. <clears throat> um, just to, to the point um, that Sir Hillary made initially about the, um, the explosion of, of British industry, there have been some attempts to model the impact of um, slave dependent infrastructure, slave dependent uh, business operations on Britain's GDP. But as we'll see in the next slide, there is a lack of historical consensus on this. Um, and it really speaks to this idea that if you want to count reparations in dollar for dollar or pound for pound, to do so would be very problematic. And we've really got to, to see beyond that type of calculus, I think, into the systemic issues that came in. Um, as I referenced. So this is just outlining some of the sort of historical estimates that have been made um, to date. And the, the next slide um, is to spotlight a few of the organizations that have been mentioned already. And I, I realize now that I, I fell into the trap of, of saying, right, well, these are the poster boys, but we're looking really now at trying to examine how deep and how extensive these relationships are and just for clarity um, we looked here at beneficiaries as referenced before they appear um, on the uh, compensation paid, um, to people for the loss of their property enslaved um, men women and children um, so in the final slide I just wanted to um, call attention to some of the sort of attitudes that have been displayed by the British government um, and this idea that recognition um, and apology and then walking away may well be seen as enough by some of these institutions. Um, particularly notable was David Cameron in 2015 when given a, a very specific petition for a summit with Caribbean nations uh, to discuss reparations said he, he thought it would be better to move on and focus on the future and building a, a stronger relationship between the West Indies and, and, um, and West African nations and, and Britain, which um, everybody can form their own opinion about, I think. That was very diplomatically done at the end there, Luke. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, um, as I said, um, uh, we're very grateful, Bell, that you've, I, I think you've come from one thing to another, but um, Bell Ribeiro Addy is the MP for Streatham. And if you're there, Bell, I'm just gonna see if I can find you. Um, hey, yeah, I, I'm here. Hi there, hi there. I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking if I might just to sort of, if you like, I just was saying to Sir Hilary Beckles that to an extent we've done a lot of difficult stuff, but not the really difficult stuff, which is the argument about reparations and what reparatory justice would look like. Would you, would you lead us off on that? What you think is a, is a way of approaching it that will be first and foremost fair, but also command some level of public support. Okay, well, I, firstly, I think we'd have to accept the fact that um, you could never really, uh, you know, compensate for what has happened to people and what continues to happen to people because mm. of uh, the transatlantic slow trade. I mean, accepting that you would never ever be able to, to, to fully, uh, you know, have the, the right amount of reparative justice is probably the best place to start. Um, and then realizing from there that we shouldn't make it so complicated. Yes, it's definitely a complex situation, but I think the way in which people have viewed it has, has, has created a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. Anytime anybody uses the words reparations, people like to think that we're talking about immediately handing over large sums of money and then becomes a conversation about who gets how much and where, um, but I think we need to look at, at, at the basics first. Firstly, it's an acceptance that wrong was done. Right. As far as I'm concerned, there has been no sort of real apology from anybody. Um, there was something that Tony Blair said, there was something that David Cameron said, but none of those were, were a true and, and, and real apology from this country um, for, for the, the transatlantic slave trade. In fact, there was, there was one, um, not from a leader of the country, but from, the, from London, the mayor of London. I think somebody actually mentioned it in the chat um, just a few minutes ago. There was an apology from the mayor of London, but in terms of, of a, a city um, or, or this entire country, that's the only real apology we've had. So apologizing, apologizing, I believe, firstly puts people on equal footing 
because I always say you only would apologize to your equals um, mm -hmm. if they are not apologizing um, to these countries and, and the descendants of these countries, then they do not see them as equal um, and, and slightly a different discussion. But I think that that has a lot of bearing on the racism that mm. we see mm. today. Mm. Uh, following on from that, ju just looking at where you can start to begin uh, making the most simple um, reparations. And, and, and so you've apologized, you're looking at repairing that relationship. Um, and perhaps giving artifacts back. There are some very, very valuable artifacts that we have in, um, in the British Museum. 80% of the British Museum's uh, uh, loot is mm. kept in the basement and you know only 20% is ever put up on display. We should probably start with giving some things back. We should look at, at again, debt, debt. Um, the debt for some of these countries uh, that face slave, that were enslaved people put, or uh, were, were colonized, all of those countries should look, this country should look at forgiving all of their debt. Mm -hmm. so, uh, much of this debt has been paid over again and again in terms of uh, interest. Uh, that's definitely a way to start. Mm -hmm. And then looking at other forms, infrastructural um, reparations. Now we know um, quite clearly that as part of colonization, one of the, the main things um, that was done was to in some ways deliberately underdeveloped some of these countries, keeping them dependent on, on the West. And by that, I mean, I mean European countries are keeping them dependent on the UK and the other European countries. So they were deliberately underdeveloped, assisting with infrastructure uh, mm -hmm. to make things better there. And looking at educational reparations, and that's in, 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 in a completely you know, holistic sense in terms of looking at teaching black history in as part of the curriculum in schools here, because it is British history, it's part of our history, um, making sure that our history, we, we are reflected in that same history. Um, and, and, and I think actually just starting there. And then I know, um, you know, Sir Hilary Beckles, uh, who we've held a meeting here uh, with at the, the House of Commons a, a good few years back, he might remember as, as hosted uh, by Diane Abbott MP, um, who's the first black woman elected to parliament, looking at what specific groups of countries are asking for. Now, now CARICOM have a very specific request. So, mm. you know, we've started with the, the simple things in terms of reparatory justice, and then we're moving on to the slightly more complex ones. But I do not believe that we can start unless there is a full apology and a full acknowledgement. Um, and then, you know, we start looking at the very, very basics in terms of putting people on, on equal footing and putting those nations on equal footing, putting those people, those people that look like me on an equal footing. And, and Belle, can I, can I ask you, I'm, I'm really struck by the, the, the there's, there's something sort of self-selecting about a group of people who on a wet October evening think, oh, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tune in and try and think about Britain's slavery. And almost by definition, they're gonna be, you know, at the very least interested and quite, quite probably sympathetic to the position. I, I'm struck by Jarena Chowdhury, um, who, uh, Jarena, I hope I've pronounced her first name right, who says, there will never be reparations because the British government has to then return all the other things it stole from other countries. Museums will have to empty the Queen's crown. Jewels will never return to India, Myanmar, etc. I mean, by the way, there are a queue of people I can imagine behind Jarena goes, and another thing, and another thing, and another thing. Uh -huh. What, what do you say to those people who think, you know what, this is just, this is a sort of going to be an argument amongst ourselves. We're never going to really move the political centre of gravity in the UK to deliver something uh, uh, that we're talking about. Well, I'll say it's, it's about a willingness. I understand uh, what people are saying, but I don't think um, we need to go down that road of making it I don't know, it, 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 in some ways more burdensome than it actually has to be. I'm, I'm not saying that it's not going to cost. I'm not saying that it's not going to be painful. But when you do something wrong and you have to compensate people for it, you lose out. Um, but you are, you are, you know, making reparatory justice. You are, you are paying for what has been done in the past. When I made this argument in um, the House of Commons and it, it was, there was a bit of a discussion about it, we had one uh, MP obviously from the Conservative side making a point that, well, he's going to go back and, and uh, you know, ask the Romans uh, to for his compensation for his country, um, you know, being, being invaded by Rome, the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be careful not to go back to a point of, of I don't want to use the word ridicule, but I mean, it, 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 there's a point at which obviously you cannot see what has happened. The difference between um, attempting to get 
compensation from the Romans and attempting to look at the slave trade and colonialism yeah. is that this is this is in the very it, it, this is very recent. You can see where yeah. pit slaves were taken. You can see um, what artifacts were taken. You can see who was colonized and you can see the impact that it's had. And mm. because you can see all of that, because that is very, very clear, it's very, very clear where you need to make those reparations. So yes, the line may be long, but where things are more difficult to prove, I understand why it would be difficult to make those reparations. Where mm. we have very, very clear links, um, mm -hmm. there's not a reason not to. So, so I'm going to, well, thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to go back to Kende Andrews and, and to Celery Beckles, if I might. Kende, we, we sort of got started on the question about systemic problems, structural problems, and then, if you like, full social and national responsibility in terms of responding to them. Can you spell out, you, you know, you say your book you know, that comes out next year talks about a, a, a colonialism and empire that exists still. What needs to be done today? What's your argument of what the answer should be today? Uh, uh, I just want to clarify a couple of things that I think are really important because we often think, forget that Africa was devastated by slavery. I mean, actually, the Organization of African uh, Unity first caused reparations before Caribbean countries because Africa destroyed the, the economy that way. Mm. Uh, slavery destroyed the economy. It's that, that Africa is still underpopulated because of slavery. So the legacy there are very clear. Um, the other thing is this is a collective responsibility. Who was it that paid um, the reparations to slave owners? It, it was the government, right? Because the government recognized the centrality of slavery to the economy. So therefore, when we think about this, this big picture, then we have to say it has to be on the governmental level. It has mm. to be on a societal level. And it does mean a, a, a significant transfer of wealth to the, those people whose, whose lives and economies were decimated by slavery, which would be the Caribbean, uh, Caribbean countries, which would be African countries, and which would be this, the descendants of slave, um, uh, slaves here. I mean, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty obvious that the poverty from, from the slave trade is still with us. And so the very simple premise is, well, therefore you have to put economic resources into dealing with that. I mean, and that could be, on a, let's just take Britain, for example, it wouldn't make sense to give individual the same way i'm saying it doesn't make sense to look at individual families it makes very little sense to give individual I don't, I don't give me money like giving me a check. we're not we're not sending no. individuals checks no, don't make it, that's ridiculous i don't need a check for, for uh, reparations but what we do need is we need to invest money in the areas that are hugely problematic so the inner city areas of, of, of like where i live in birmingham huge, a large population of those people who are formerly enslaved mm. um and significant issues of poverty educational access etc mm -hmm. invest mm -hmm. money there right invest money in uh, like some like um, uh, Bell was saying, invest money in the economies in, in the Caribbean, etc. That's what needs to be done. Social responsibility and a social answer. It's it's quite simple because otherwise, if we're serious about saying we want to address racial inequality, then you have to put money into it because it's basically is created. It was an economic thing in the first place, which has created economic wealth and the, and the poverty that we have. There's no way to address this without a massive transfer of wealth if we're serious about it. So, so Hilary Beckles, can I ask you to follow up on what Kevin Andrews is saying? Because, and if, and if you would, we you just talk through, please do answer that Ellie House's point about, you know, what the college should do. But can you also talk specifically about the CARICOM and reparatory justice? Because the thing that I was struck by when I read it, and I sort of went through at least the 10 point plan, is you look at that and you think, this is not what people think of as reparations. It's not as Kane and Andrews is saying. It's not, you know, send me a check. It's it, it, it's it's a ten point plan that feels incredibly doable. But but you'll do a better job of spelling out what it is and why you think and how you think it can be done. The, the conversation is largely about power, and people can define uh, what they believe reparations is. And unfortunately, it it is it is it is a discourse of power. Um, in which um, uh, European governments might well say, well, this is all in the past. As, as our member of parliament has said, a member of the House of Lords make reference to Rome. Mm -hmm. This is not in the past. This is today. This is about today. This is not some remote historical past. These crimes were committed and their legacies are being felt all around us every single day. And we would like to have a conversation from the point of view of the victim. Mm -hmm. It is not for the extractor of wealth and those who benefited from the crimes to define for us what reparations is mm -hmm. and to tell us whether we are deserving of it or not. Mm -hmm. And to take the high ground position that we're not having this conversation because we think that you have no entitlement. 
flip it around and listen to the voice of those who have been the victims. And if you historicize that, you go right back. Let us take, for example, your Emancipation Act. Mm -hmm. British Emancipation Act in itself was one of the most racist piece of legislations ever passed by the British Parliament. And I made that point in the British Parliament, and this is why. First, you decide that you're going to pay compensation to the slave owners. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can pay compensation to the slave owners is to pay what is called property compensation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. therefore, the Emancipation Act had to begin with the notion that the 800,000 people owned by the British, the 800,000 Africans enslaved and owned by the British are property. So the act had to begin if these 800,000 black people are property. Mm. Because they are property, we are going to pay property compensation. Mm -hmm. And you understand that it was the first time in British history that the parliament had actually finally, finally decided that black people were not human beings, but property. Mm -hmm. So the parliament had to deem them property in order to pay property compensation to those who allegedly owned them. But you look at the act itself. The British government determined that these 800,000 people were worth 45 million pounds. That was their property value. That was their replacement value. They are worth 45 million pounds. So yeah. we, have to pay, we have to pay the slave owners. Now, how are we going to pay them? 45 million pounds in 1833 is about half of the national expenditure of the entire country for that year. Mm -hmm. It's a massive amount of money, but we're going to pay them half of that. So the British government said, we will pay them 20 million in cash. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to pay the slave, if the government of Britain is going to pay the slave owners 20 million in cash, who's going to pay the remaining 25 million? Because the Emancipation Act said that they must be compensated in full and fairly for the loss of their property. So who's going to pay 25 million? So what the British government did was to frame the act to say, we're going to pay 20 million in cash up front. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to make the slaves who we have just freed work for free for another five to six years for the people who have freed them. Yes. So they, they, they got their freedom and then they had to work for free for another four years to work off in kind the remaining 25 million. So the slave owner got the slave owner got 20 million in cash from the government. Mm -hmm. and 25 million in additional free labor from the slaves. So the slaves paid more and for yes. their emancipation than the British government paid. Fast forward, fast forward 100 years, the countries of the Caribbean are now asking for independence. They want to bring an end to empire. These are the descendants of slaves. And they go to the British government for support. Mm -hmm. The first thing they said is, listen, after emancipation, you continued your extraction of wealth from the Caribbean. But the, the millions of people, the six million people from whom you got free labor, yeah. you got free labor from six million people for 200 years. So, if, you, if you calculate the value of, that. Of, of 200 years of free labor from six million people yes you go into you go into three to four trillion pounds in fact that was the calculation made and Hillary, I'm, I'm, gonna, now, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to stop you i'm sorry because we just got to 7 30 and i know we've just got to actually the number and i also am aware that i haven't even given promise a chance to come back to you and i want to make sure promise gets one one final word but we're not going to stop there so i'm going to just let promise way in and then I'm going to try and let you know what we're going to do as a newsroom next because anyone who's listening to this conversation feels as though we would surely feels that we just scratched the surface of it promise yeah um, to, I have to be fair uh, I have not been given a very fair ground in this debate uh, and in this discussion I think a lot of I mean you you, you can see that uh, our co-panelists my co-panelists have spoken a lot and I was interrupted twice twice I was speaking uh, and what I didn't even arrive at my point and the debate well, well, went on and, on. And, and, and promise I'm sorry I'm sorry for that and I'm aware of that we've just had 
sometimes those things uh, happen, but I want to make sure that you do now. So please let me know what you what you wanted to say. Okay, so the point I want to make uh, is is very simple. Uh, it is that slavery was a human institution, and it is still a human institution. And human beings have a natural tendency of trying to make profit from whatever they come into contact with. And whether it is their fellow human beings, whether it is the cash crops, anything that they can actually profit from, this is something like a natural human tendency. And slavery operated that way right from the 1400 until when it was abolished. And if you go into Africa and African history, there was already slavery even before, which, which the transatlantic slave trade fed on. So there was already an institution of slavery and that affected, it was very political. I was talking about my society, mm -hmm. my Igbo ethnic group, which, is, which has been written on and published by Cambridge University Press mm -hmm. by uh, um, Ugomo Keiji. And if you look at in that book, he describes the institution of slavery and how it operated. And how it operated was the political elites controlled this, this means of production. They were not enslaved. The political elites were not enslaved. Those who were enslaved were those who were captured. And the culture, the economy of the Aro society was founded on slavery. And because they made a lot of profit for years and centuries, when they got so addicted to it, they didn't even want to abandon slavery. They didn't abandon slavery. After slavery was abolished in 1807, 1808, 1809, it still persisted in Aro society where I, 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 I was born. It still persisted. And it was in 1901 and 1902 that mm -hmm. the British had to come in and they fought, seriously, you can go and check it out. There is the Anglo-Arrow War. And what was the Anglo-Arrow War about? The mm -hmm. Anglo-Arrow War was about abolishing slavery, which the Arrow Society, the Igbo Society, didn't want to give up because it was part of their political economy and part of their society. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't give it up, giving it up meant giving up everything in the society. But yes. that ended in war. And after the war ended, then there was, they, they had to find other means of trading, which was not based on trading in human beings. Right. Now, so till, just, till today, I'm just aware, I know I are, you aware, are you aware that till today, that in my society, you cannot marry somebody who is a descendant of a slave? Are you aware of that? We have a people called the Osu. Mm -hmm. They are the descendants of slaves in the Igbo society. Mm. And there is the Diala, those who enslaved them. Mm. Until today, you can't marry them mm. because they believe that the descendants of slaves are still slaves until today. Pr this is happening uh, in uh, Igbo society. So if you are talking about reparation, we should be also talking about how do we make amends within African society for the people who have been enslaved by their own people. Mm. How do we abolish the practices, some of the practices that have been entrenched in African societies that mm. don't allow Africans, because of the slavery, history of slavery, to mm. be free as individuals? This is the, the contemporary, and there are lots of campaigns today that they should abolish everything about the Osu and the Diala, the slaves and the freeborn mm. within Igbo land. It's still mm. ongoing. So mm. when we're talking about reparation and we focus too much on Britain and America, we tend to neglect yes. that. There is an African society where there is the, the elite and the, the lesser ones. This, the practice is still ongoing. And uh, we are not talking about reparation. In yes, the, in promise, this respect. Promise, promise, will you forgive me? I'm sorry to interrupt because I appreciate how important this is. And I also appreciate that what you're talking about is a subject that we are sorely in danger of neglecting. I also want to respect the time of everyone who's joined because this is not something that is going to be unfortunately resolved within the course of this hour. As you've seen, we've even struggled to keep it within the hour. What, what, I, what I can say is, look, we are, a, we are a slow newsroom. Our thinking is we try to understand some of these big subjects that many people would say, look, you know, this is just, you know, this is, this is either too difficult, too complicated, or, you know, uh, not, not a story for us given COVID or Trump. 
what I can say is this is very much a story for us. I think there is a massive exercise here in, in listening and learning. I take away from this four things, which I hope you'll see we follow up and try to understand. The one is, the first one is, the, the point at the very top that, you know, Hilary Beckles picked up on and that Samantha Knight's touched upon, which was just the system of education, what we learn and most importantly, what we don't learn and how we think about that. And I'm really struck by the, the point you're making at the end there, Promise, which actually chimes, which is not only do we not know our history, we don't have an agreed narrative on that history. There's not a, there's not a, even though history is about debating and discussing and disagreeing, the central elements of it are not even part of the curriculum and the discussion. And so that, whether you're in the UK or Africa, seems to me to be absolutely central. There is, I think, something incredibly positive and exciting that's going on, which is the work that people like Kayleigh Andrews, that, you know, Keith uh, McClelland are doing, which is saying, look, you can trace this. This doesn't need to be, quote unquote, like the Roman Empire. You can actually see that it tracks straight through into today and it makes us understand it and makes that history real and, and present. I found it really helpful to pick up on the kind of, let's not apologize and walk away, let's not research and run, you know, the implications for institutions like the royal family, like the uh, like universities, et cetera. But I did take the central point that Candy was making, which is don't allow that, those kind of shiny institutional beneficiaries to detract from the central point that there is something systemic here and that you need to think about it as systems. The one thing I think we had the least time for, which is strangely the one area that I feel as though is probably that was the most was the most promising was the approach that Bell took, which was saying, actually, there is a way of thinking about reparations and the business of repair, starting with apology, starting then moving on to what you can actively do, and then moving on to the kinds of support that that, that Hillary was talking about, that Bell was talking about, that change uh, change the terms and address some of the fundamental economic inequalities that are so visible in 2020. So what I can say is we're going to continue this. We're probably going to do something sensible next time, which is take each of those subjects in turn so we can give ourselves more time to do them in more detail. But for now, um, thank you. Thank you, everyone in the chat. I appreciate there were lots of points that we still didn't even get to, but I really want to say thank you to Sir Hilary Beckles, a big thank you to Professor Andrews, thank you to Promise Edger for, uh, and um, thank you for, for, for weighing in so forcefully at the end there. I'm sorry that we got right to the end there. Thank you too to Keith McClellan, thank you to Samantha Knight, thank you to uh, Bell Ribeiro Addy. There's a reason I begin to realise why we ran over time. We had so many great people and so much to discuss. But for tonight, thank you very much indeed and look forward to discussing it again. Thanks again. <laughs>